Okay, welcome to this Qt in-depth session. So my name is Janne Antila, and I'm working in Qt Commercial R&D as an architect. And, and then I started in Ditsia over 11 years ago as a Symbian, Symbian software engineer. Since then, I have participated in quite many different mobile software projects, basically from different levels, from the adaptation to UI level, and from different domain areas, like from the protocol stacks to the, to the navigation software and things like that. So I did quite a lot of those projects in the beginning. And then I started to study the Qt about five years, five years ago. <clears throat> and actually, I started my Qt journey by doing quite deep study of the Qtopia. So some of you may remember that Qtopia was an project's attempt to build a complete mobile phone application suite based on the Qt. So I, I did analyze that quite deeply and actually evaluated that how much it would take to build a complete mobile phone based on that, that platform. And then did some small projects before, before starting to dig into Qt on Symbian. So I actually did the first proof of, con proof of concept implementation about the Qt on Symbian platform, and that already happened before the Nokia acquired Trolltech. And after that acquisition, I participated in the actual porting project for several years. And, and then did some smaller projects before joining the Qt commercial R&D at Ditsia. So I, I have been working quite a lot of it with the uh, internals of the Qt and not that much with the application level. <coughs> but I guess that's uh, quite okay background for this presentation. So in this session, I will explain for you the most important design patterns of the Qt, uh, such as uh, private implementation, implicit sharing, uh, meta system with the signal slots, and then the event processing. And if there's still time left, I will talk some, something about the atomic operations as well. But in the moon, I run out of time, so let's see. <coughs> And my goal for this presentation is to explain these uh, design patterns and concepts from the, from the Qt internals point of view. So meaning that I will try to explain why some things has been used in the Qt and how they have been implemented. Uh, I hope this presentation helps you to uh, understand the Qt internals better and deeper understanding of Qt internals hopefully makes your life easier because it should, should make the debugging easier and should be easier to write the more, more performance of, uh, efficient code and easy the contributions to, to the Qt project, basically. Okay, then to the actual first topic, the private implementation. So before looking into details, that what the private implementation is and how it is used in Qt, I would like to give you some highlights why private implementation is needed. So as you all know, the Qt is cross-platform application development framework and writing a an good and maintainable uh, cross-platform code typically means that uh, platform code should be isolated from the API level as much as possible. And the cross-platform also means that there will be several implementations of some classes, basically one implementation for each platform. And being a widely adopted framework like Qt, <coughs> it typically means that some kind of binary compatibility need to be provided as well. And to maintain that binary compatibility, we need to uh, follow some rules. So for example, it is not possible to add a member variable to class because that would change the object size. But of course, we need to have a way to extend the framework during the uh, lifetime. 
So, so to add that bug fixes or new features or new modules to the queue and so on. And to tackle those uh, restrictions of the binary compatibility, but at the same time maintain the extendability, some solution is needed. And the private, private implementation is such solution. So what is private implementation design pattern? I have here an example in very simple form. And this example is actually not acute related yet. It's just a generic example about the private implementation. So private implementation is actually quite simple. You just split the, app, the class to two different parts, the public part and the private part. And the public part will provide the API and holds a pointer to the private class. So in essence, the public class just have a one data member, which is the pointer to the private class. And then the private class contains all the actual data, member variables, and things like that. And there can be also different implementations of the private, private class for different platforms. And in order to use the uh, private pointer in the public side, we of course need to tell the compiler something about the type. So in this example, we can use the forward declaration to the, to the private class. Okay, that was a generic example and then something about the queue and how, how the private implementation is used there. First of all, in Qt, the uh, implementation of the private implementation concept is called D-pointer. And that D-pointer is used uh, basically everywhere in the Qt code. But there are some exceptions. For example, the Q-color, Q-size, and Q-rect those classes are considered, considered uh, trivial ones, and such classes which doesn't require any changes in the future. So there is no sense to add an extra indirection to those, those classes, since that would just add extra overhead. There are also a set of other classes where the performance is considered to, considered to be so important that the private implementation doesn't fit to that purpose. So for example, the few graphics items. And when you start looking at the uh, Qt code, you will quickly find out that D pointer is actually used in two different contexts in the Qt. So one being the Q object based classes and another being the implicit shared classes. There will be a more information about implicit sharing later on. So let's take a look at the private implementation in Q object first. When the private implementation is applied for the key objects, those uh, pointers to the private side or to the public side are, are stored in the base class. So we have a, a D pointer to access the, uh, access the private uh, object from the public side. And in the other way around, we have the Q pointer to access the, private, access the public uh, object from the private side. And, and what else? And instead of having the, having the separate private object for each of the public classes, the key object mirrors the, the public API hierarchy, also in the private side. So each key object has a private counterpart. So for example, here we have a key object, which has the key object private, and key widget, which has the key widget private. And why we have the same class hierarchy in the, in the private side as well? The reason is that we want to reduce the memory allocations. So if you think, for example, some cla uh, UI class like QList widget, it has quite deep uh, class inheritance hierarchy, something like five to six levels. So if we would 
be using the D pointer without this mirror class hierarchy thing, there would be up to five to six memory allocations for the private objects alone. And that, of course, it's not what we want. Um, yeah, and this relationship between the public and private parts is actually bidirectional. So the private class holds a pointer to the public side as a, as a Q pointer, and the other way around you have the D pointer to them. From, from, from public side to the private side. So, okay, now we have this D pointer and Q pointer as a base class type. So how do I access the actual object type? Well, of course, you are using the casting, but instead of, use, in, instead of doing that casting everywhere by yourself, the Qt provides some utility and convenience macros. So I guess most of you have already met with those macros. And what they actually do is that the Qt declare private that defines a function named dfunk to perform the upcasting from D pointer to the subclass type, so the actual private object type. So here you can see the example of that uh, macro implementation for the Q widget. So it casts the D pointer to the, to the Q widget private. And then there is this Q declare public, which is it's very similar to the Q declare pri private, but it's used in the private side. And that defines a function named Q func to perform the casting from Q pointer. Okay, now we have, have the, those functions on top of the Q pointer and D pointer, but we don't need to use even those because we have a one, one more extra layer on top of that. So you can use the QD and QQ macros to uh, basically to introduce a local member variable to access the private or public side. So there you can see the implementation of the QD macro. That just calls the defunct uh, method to create the local D pointer. And corresponding the QQ macro creates a pointer named Q to the public class type. Okay, here is basically the same thing with the code example, that how those macros are used. So the QDeclare macros are used in the class declaration or the header file to define those dfunk and qfunk functions for the classes. And then in the implementation, so in the CPP file, we can use those QD and QQ macros to create the local local variables to access the private or public side. So what, what if you would like to apply the same pattern for your own class? Basically, you are out of luck because the private classes are private in the Qt and utility macros are not documented and they are not meant to be used by, by third parties. Of course, if you are extending the Qt uh, libraries by yourself, then you can, can use them. But if you are developing the application, you shouldn't use them. So you have probably seen this warning in the private, private headers of the Qt that you shouldn't use them. But if you need a similar design pattern in your own code, that's of course quite easy to implement by following the uh, same or the, by following the queue that how it's implemented there. And still it's quite important to imp understand this uh, private implementation design pattern because it make, makes your makes easier to debug the queued code. So in the beginning of the private implementation slides we saw that the uh, it's mainly needed due to the binary compatibility and to be able to isolate the platform specific code from the API level. Yes, that is the primary reason 
for the uh, private implementation in Qt, but there are also some other benefits with this design pattern. So because those public classes just hold a pointer to the private class, the compiler is happy with the forward declaration. And that means that using the API, Qt API, doesn't bring a huge include hierarchy with it. And that makes the application build time somewhat faster. And also the fact that the API doesn't hold any implementation details might be also important in some, some closed source projects. So you don't need to expose the, your secret, secrets basically for the customers or the competitors. And actually the fact is that also the Qt started as a closed source pro project. And yes, of course, hiding the implementation details from the public API also makes the interface more cleaner. So then the summary of the private implementation, it's, it is an internal design pattern for managing the binary compatibility. So class is separated to the public and private parts, and it, it is used almost everywhere in the Qt. In Qt based classes, and in implicit shared classes. And there are few helper macros often used to uh, ease the public or private access in Qt. And the private implementation has also a positive impact to the encapsulation and build times. Any questions about the private implementation in this ways? Okay, if not, let's go to the implicit sharing, which is the another, another topic which is using the private implementation as well. So let me start again with some background and rationale for the, for the implicit sharing. So C++ has two different semantics for, for passing the parameters and return values. So value-based semantics and reference-based semantics. So the value-based semantics is applied for the internal types like integer, float, and so on. And when you are using the value-based semantics, the data is copied when passed, and the core can be sure that the original value is not modified. And that's typically used for the small objects which are allocated from the stack. And there is no need for the no need for the const or reference usage because the data is copied, and no problems with the lifetime lifetime and etc. So it's quite easy to use. And one thing to remember is that C++ by default is value based based. So if you don't define the default uh, the copy constructors or assigned operators, the, the compiler will, will generate those for you. And that is some, sometimes something that you don't want. And then the reference-based semantics, that's typically used for the bigger objects, where the copying is too expensive for value-based semantics. And when you are using the reference-based semantics, the, the developer basically need to take care of ownership and protect the variables for the unwanted changes and things like that. So it's a bit harder to use than the value-based semantics. So what if we would like to get the benefits both of those? The easy use of the value-based semantics, but still avoid the unnecessary copies. That's actually what implicit sharing gives for you. So what is implicit sharing? Well, first you should probably remember that the, that's the another place where the Qt is using the private implementation. So in, in these value-based uh, implicit shared classes, the private implementation is actually the shared container. And that shared container has all the op object data. And why it is in this way 
it's, it's implemented that way because that maximizes the memory usage and minimizes the copying. So basically the size of the implicit shared object, meaning the public object, is basically void pointer. And because we are sharing the data container, we need to have some reference count it, counting there to see that when we can actually release the shared container. So what all of this mean, means in practice, it means that copying the implicit shared object is very fast. You just uh, create a new pointer to the shared data and then increment the reference count by one. But at the moment when you start modifying the data, the shared data is detached or, or copied basically. And that's of course lower operation. And actually this, this gives also another name for this design pattern called copy and write. But this copying, when you change the, change the data, happens behind the scenes. So you don't need to care about, the, about that, basically. So what I mean with that is that you should use the implicit shared classes as a separate objects and use them like you would, you would use the built-in types like integer or, or floating point or something like that. Let's then take a look at the implicit sharing with the help of one example. So here I have a, a small program, which purpose is to check that if given word is a palindrome or not. So when we start this program, there is one QString variable called candidate created. And that, that variable is initialized to the shared null. I will explain later on what that actually means. Then we continue running the program. We step into the get word method. And in that method, the another Q string is created. So the, the Q string called initial. And because that is uh, straight away initialized to level, to string level, there is new QString data object allocated for it. And the string refers to it. So in this phase, the reference count of the QString data for this level string is, is, is one. And when the program returns from that function, we assign the return value to the candidate string. So basically we just keep the level QString data in memory and change the pointer from the candidate public queue string to the, that another private object. <clears throat> then when this is palindrome is called, we create a new queue string variable called test and that refers to the same shared container. And when we return from there, that test variable goes out of scope. But then we call the print result, which again creates a new, new QString object called word, which is local for that function, and that's referring the same level shared container. And once the execution returns from that print result, the reference count is once more decremented back to the one. So only now the candidate is referring to that, that Q-string data. Yep. Mm-hmm. Why they would create? No, actually, you will see it later on. You just we just change the change the pointer, the private pointer. Yeah.
Yeah. Yeah, and finally, when we got, go out of scope of this main function, the candidate string gets deleted, and that decrements the reference count to zero, and also the private shared container will be deleted. So here I have uh, some code snippets from the Qt to see that how, how that actually is implemented, that implicit sharing in the Qt. So there is a Q-string default constructor, which initializes the D pointer to zero at null and increases the reference count by one. And then there's a copy constructor, which just assigns the D pointer to the other D pointer and in increases the reference count by one. And then the destruct destructor just uh, decrements the reference count, and if it goes to the zero, it frees the shared container. And then it assigned operator, we first uh, increase the reference count for the other object, the other uh, private object, and then check, decrement the reference count for this object and free the, free the current shared container if needed, and then just assign the D pointer to the other D. So this is how it's implemented in Qt. So as you can see, all of those operations what we are doing here are, are quite fast. And we avoid the unnecessary copies. Okay, then a bit information about this shared null optimization. So all of the implicit shared, shared uh, classes have a static uh, data called shared null. And that shared null represents the static instance of the implicit shared data, which is never de deleted. So meaning that its reference count starts at one. So if you take a look at the code on the right side, you will see that the first uh, member variable in the Q string data is ref, so the atomic uh, reference count. And then in the header file, there is also this uh, uh, static uh, date shared null variable introduced. And then in the CPP side, uh, implementation side, we initialize that shared null variable to null basically, and put the or give the reference count value one. So the Q basic atomic in initializer one there gives that value for it. And then we can use that in the, for example, in default constructor. And why this optimization is used in the Qt, the reason is that with that way we can get the easy and fast default constructors. We don't need to allocate for the empty objects and there's no need to check if the D pointer is null because it always exists. Okay, that's about the implicit sharing. Any questions in this way? It works with those as well because the well the Qt takes care of that they just increment the reference count if the copy is basically needed. Or not well when you when you pass the let's say Q-string as a signal, the, the, the receiving side will just increment the reference count by one to that shared container. Okay. Yeah. I think I get, I get a little bit yeah, I do get a little, little bit because, yeah, that's, no, I don't have a measurements, but it's just a very small one because 
you save this one, one allocation for this, uh, basically for this Q-string public site. Uh, well, I would say that in most places it's, it's not, but of course in very performant critical places that might be important. <coughs> okay, let's then take a look at the meta object system. So first I take I'll give you a few examples that why the meta object system is needed in the queue. So think about a very simple example that you have a button which you would like to use to switch the lamp on and off. And there are of course several ways to solve that kind of uh, problem with the, with the C or C++. You can use the or make the uh, lamp as a member variable of the button, but then you don't have a reusability, so that's not very very good solution. You could uh, uh, add some abstraction there, so that you have a generic purpose button and specialized button to switch that lamp on or off. You have a bit more or better re reusability here, but still direct uh, dependency between the specialized button and the lamp. You can do it other way around to have an observer for the, for the button and in that way make the button more generic but still you have dependency between the button and lamp through the abstraction. Or you can even add more the abstraction there. So you have a several different, different ways to implement this but well, probably not, because you can have a, the internet abstraction, you can have some implementation as well, of course. Abstract class could be a Q object. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> but what is common for all of those solutions that I displayed for you here? The common thing is that the, the lamp and the button need, needs to know about each other at compile time in some form, either direct uh, dependency or dependency, dependency to root abstraction. <coughs> so what about if you could solve the problem completely at runtime? That would provide us some flexibility. So some examples. So if you would like to change in some ho home automation system the button that is associated to lamp, that wouldn't be too easy to do with the build time, build time based solution that I displayed in the previous slide. Or what if you would like to add a new button or motion sensor to control the lamp, that probably is even harder to as heave with the compile time solutions. Or if you would like to add a, new, add a possibility to remote control the lamp, for example with your fo mobile phone. That kind of solutions are not that easy to implement with the uh, compile time dependencies. So to implement the solution, which is, which is completely runtime based, we need a reflection. So the reflection is, is basically a mechanism to access or investigate yourself, also called in introspection. So you can think the reflection basically as a runtime access your class static and build time structure. So with the reflection you can basically uh, investigate the object, what, for example, that check that what kind of properties or methods it implements. And many, many programming languages actually provide this reflection as a built-in feature, but unfortunately C++ is not one of those. So Qt has its own extension called meta system to extend the Qt with reflection support. So what is meta system? It is a basically a system which extends the C++ with dynamic features. 
So those reflection features. And dynamic features being such as uh, mechanism to access any function in class based on the function name, or MetaApp system can provide an detailed information about the class, such as a class name, superclass name, list of the methods and enumerations in that class, and so on. And those dynamic features also include uh, such features like dynamic properties, meaning that you can basically add uh, named uh, variables to the object at runtime. This can be, for example, useful in some data parsing applications. And if you are familiar with the Java, you may find some, some uh, familiar features from there, from the, from the reflection, because the Java is supporting the reflection by, by default. Okay, I think that's enough about theory. So. Let's take a look at an uh, example how this meta system actually works. So in the following slides, I will use this, <coughs> this class as a baseline. So when looking at the meta generated code. So we have a one class called myObject. It is a key object uh, subclass. And the class has just one slot called uh, my slot and one signal called my signal. So quite simple class. And when you have that kind of class in Qt, everything basically starts from the key object. So key object is a keyword uh, for QMake to generate the make rule or make file rule to run the meta compiler during the build time. And in addition, it declares a few functions that MetaApt compiler will implement. So during the build process, the MetaApt compiler will generate an implementation for those, those methods and some additional stuff to, the, to support the MetaApt system. We'll take a look at them later on. Okay, here I have a uh, snippet from the meta object uh, file for this simple class that I saw for you in the previous slide. So first of all, there, is, there are a few arrays, cute metadata, my object. That is basically an array of indexes to this another array, which is called a cute meta string data. And that string data, uh, string array contains the class names, signals, and slots as a string. And then there is uh, this static meta object function to instantiate the Q meta object based on, based on those arrays. I will give you some examples that what actually those values they are. So for example, the zero in the index array refers to the uh, string array, and from that index you can find the uh, class name. So our class name was my object. Then there is a uh, 14. That tells for us that, well, there's first this two, which tells for us that there are two different methods in this class, my, my slot and my signal. And there's this uh, index 14, which tells from where we can find those uh, signals or signal slots from the index array. So that actually refers to the 10 in the index array. And that 10 then refers to the my signal in the string data array. So based on that uh, structure, data structure, Qt can resolve at runtime what signal slots and properties are declared in some class. Yeah, and this nine here tells for us that we don't have a, have a parameters for this my, my signal, and that points to the empty string in the string data 
array. So that was one, one part that Metap compiler implements for you or generates for you. In addition to that, the Metap compiler will generate for you some or implementation of some methods. Like the meta object, which simply returns the static Q meta object, object and cute meta cast, which returns this pointer if the past class name is, is the given class name. And it also implements all the signals for your objects. So, summary of the MetaOpt system. The MetaOpt system implements reflection capabilities to, zip, uh, to C++ in Qt and provides the mechanism to access any, any functions in the class. It provides the class information, dynamic properties, and things like that. So, the reflection features. And the meta objects are generated by the meta, meta object compiler in the Qt. And those meta object, objects are actually plain old data for easy instantiation and copying. So plain old data is one another design pattern or, or concept, basically. <coughs> and it also generates those utility functions for you. And all the signals are implemented by it. So Qt signal slots are implemented by using the meta objects. And let's then take a look at the signal slots which are quite tightly related to the meta system. So what the signal slots are, they are basically, uh, they basically implement generic uh, design or observer pattern for the Qt. They are type safe, so you don't need to do casting from the void point into the actual type like you are doing with the function callbacks. They are loosely coupled, so you don't need to know about the object that much. They are flexible. You can have a one-to-one, one-to-many, or many-to-many many connections there. And building blocks for those signal slots are provided by the meta system. So what happens when you call the key object connect? You typically give it uh, four arguments. First being the sender object, and second one the signal signature, and then the receiver object, and the receiver signature. So key object connect takes all of those uh, parameters and resolves the index of the signal and slot based on the signature. And that resolving is done by, based on the meta generated code. Then it stores the parts of that information to the sender and receive, sender and receiver objects. So you can basically say that the key object connect is, is a clue to find the sender signal and receiver slot index at runtime. And because the signatures are, are resolved to integral indexes at runtime, or when the connect is called, the resolving the slot, what needs to be called when you actually emit the signal is quite fast. There's just integral comparison needed. What happens then when you actually emit the signal? First, you probably know that the emit is actually just empty define. So it's used in the source code to highlight or differentiate the signals from the normal functions. Well, I, I guess that all of you already know that with the Qt, you just introduce the signals in the header files 
and you don't need to provide the implementation, but implementation is provided by the MetaApt compiler. And what kind of implementation the MetaApt compiler generates for those signals you can see it there. So it just, just calls and QMetaApt activate with the sender, so this object and the meta object from where we can pass the information and then the signal index. So we just had one my signal in this example of the index is zero. And the last zero there is the arguments or contents the arguments, but we didn't have, have those as well. So when you actually emit the signal, you just do a normal function call to mock generated function. So what happens in the QMeta activate then? So in the QObject connect, we stored uh, information about the connection to the sender object. So now when the signal is emitted, the Q uses that information to find out which slot needs to be called as a result. And then in QMetaApt activate, those slots will be activated. And how that act activation actually happens depends about the, about the thread affinity of the connected objects. So if the objects are in the same thread and the direct uh, connection is used, the QMeta object uh, activates basically just calls the QMeta call immediately with the slot index and arguments. And if the objects live in different threads, the QMeta object, object uh, activate posts and uh, QMeta call event to a receiver object event Q. And once that event gets dispatched, uh, eventually the, that calls the QMeta call from the context of the receiving, receiving object. So how is the cute meta call then implemented? So here I have a snippet about the meta, meta object uh, generated cute meta call implementation for this my object <coughs> class which had the one signal and one slot. So what happens here is that the actual signal and or slot is just called based on the index. You may probably wonder that why, why those um, signals are also included to that switch case structure. That's because you can have a connection between the signal and the signals as well. It's not necessary to have a always signal to slot connection. You can have a signal to signal connection as well. And in this method, Qt also checks the, checks the call type. So if it's an invoke meta method, then we, then we do that, that we call the actual signal slot. That's done because this, this same function is responsible for the dynamic properties as well. So if you have a dynamic properties in your class, this function will take care of setting or reading the values of those. And in that case, the in that case, the call type would be different. So the underscore C variable would have a different value. Okay, then the summary of the signal slots. So Q offset connect just binds the signal, signal and slot together based on the indexes and emit activates the signal by calling the meta generated method. And the signal activation, so Q meta activate for direct connections, it just calls the slot synchronously with the help of the Q meta call. And for Qt connections, it places the meta call event to the receiver object thread. And that that event will be then process it, process it once the event loop get, get executed and the slot will be called. OK, 
Okay, any questions about the meta system or, or signal slots? Yes, that's, that's what it does. Yes, that's what we do. Well, we do the introspection at the connect time. And when we do the emitting of the signal, then we already know that what we need to call from, which slot we need to call. Yes, there are some default values. For example, you don't need to give the, well, I don't remember all of those overloads, but there are some, some defaults as well. You, for example, you don't need to give the receiver object in some cases, or, or the sender object, because that is by default that is. If, ah. Yes, it works. You can have a smaller uh, amount of uh, parameters in the, in the slot, basically. Yeah, yeah. But, only, but only if it has default parameters. It doesn't need to be even default parameter. Okay. It, if, if you have a smaller amount of the parameters in the slot, those will be just ignored, the rest. And how will it be called? Uh, yeah. Sorry? Ah, okay, yeah, yeah, well, I did it, understood it in a different way, yeah. Yeah, I think that's actually not possible, so that you have a, in signal you just have a one argument, and slot you would have a, let's say, three. Yeah. That's not possible to have, but in other way around it is possible. So you, in signal you can have a, yeah, yeah. Even in that case, I think. Okay. I'm not now 100% sure about that. Okay. They were, okay, thanks. So basically, basically in that case, it means that we generate uh, several slots with different signatures. That, yeah, okay, that's correct, yes. When you have a connection which is created. When you connect a signal to a slot, yes. it defaults an auto. What, how does it pick which method to call that? To queue it or to call it directly? If, you are, if the objects are in the same uh, thread, then it's basically a synchronous function call. Okay. But if those objects are in different thread, then it places the event to the event queue of the receiver object. That's the way how it works. I'm not aware of such, such a functionality that you would prevent it. But that's true, yeah. yeah. It happens like that. Okay, let's then go to the last topic, I guess. So the event processing. So why is the event processing used in the queue? So that's of course because the operating systems are event driven to implement the multitasking. And that provides more efficient hardware resource usage. But the queue already has those signal slots. So why, we, why do we need the events? Because basically both of them implement the same, same observer pattern. But they have a bit different semantics. So events are something that are handled, where the slots are just notified. So handled, handled basically means that the framework expects the receiving object to process the event and perform some, some action based on it. While with the signal slots connections, often the result is just some action, 
but the sender doesn't, doesn't expect you to react it, to, to react that uh, signal basically. So the decision about the about the reaction is in the receiving side when you are using the signal slots. And other differences between the events and signal slots is that with the events, the, the, the events are only targeted to the single object, but the signal slot connection can be one to one, one to many, many to many, and so on. And of course, one reason why I'm going through this event, event processing here is that, is that normally nothing happens in the UI application if the events are not processed. So in that sense, the event processing is quite important concept of the queue. So short introduction to the events in the queue. So all events are represented by queue event and subclasses. And often one, one subclass represents uh, se uh, multiple types. So for example, you have a queue mouse event, which represents uh, all the mouse events, like mouse move, uh, left or middle or right button clicked, and things like that. Or you can have a key, queue, queue key event, which has all the key event related stuff. And those subclasses also implement the API to access the event-specific data. So windowing, system typically, windowing systems typically pass the events in some generic container. So the data needs to be uh, interpreted based on the event type. And that one I also already mentioned that events are, are always targeted to single key object receiver. This of course means that the event sender needs to know the receiver somehow. And for windowing system events, the target is typically resolved based on some native ID, such as window handle. And for networking events, the receiver can be resolved based on the uh, socket descriptor or something like that. And even the events are, are targeted to single queue object receiver, the queue framework pro propagates the widget, widget specific events and only the queue widget specific events. And more about that later on. So in, in previous slide, we saw that there are two different uh, event types in the queue in high level, the spontaneous events and, and non-spontaneous events. So what are the sources for those different events, event types? For spontaneous events, there are of course the system like window system or timers or sockets. And for application generated, uh, generated events, the source is the application. And those events can be, can, be, uh, can be handled in two different ways, basically synchronously or asynchronously. And when you are using the synchronous API, the event is delivered to the directly to the receiver, and the event handler is actually executed by the sending, sending thread context. And with the asynchronous API, when you call this post event, the behavior is somewhat opposite, basically. So meaning that the code which is, which is posting the event continues execution, and the event will be just added to the event queue. And once the receiver object uh, red event processing loop gets executed, event is taken from the queue and, and process it. So here I have one figure where I try to depict how the event processing actually works in the queue, or event dispatching works in the queue. 
So we have an event dispatcher. It's one instance per, per event thread, or the per, per thread in the queue. And that's largely stateless to enable the recursion. That event dispatcher basically implements one event loop iteration. So it takes the next event from the, from the queue, translates that to the native event, or, or translates the native event to the cross-platform queue event, and then delivers it to the receiver. So in this picture, I have, I have those three different sources for the spontaneous events, like window system timers and sockets. And then for the non-spontaneous events, I have this cute event queue. And there can be a multiple dispatcher implementations. In, uh, or there are multiple dispatcher implementations in the Qt. So basically, one for each platform. And actually also one for non UI-based applications and fun for UI-based applications. And this event dispatcher for the main thread is, is created by the queue application instance. But if you are using your own queue threads, thread instances, you need to create your own event dispatcher there if you want to handle events or process events. Then there is this queue event loop, which basically controls how the dispatcher is working. And there can be multiple nested instances of the event loop. And the event loop is basically just a while loop calling the event dispatcher to process the events. And it block blocks until, until it's stopped. So here I have an example of the nested event loops. So if you have a modal dialog in your application, so you call the queue dialog exec, that will uh, create a nested event loop drawn with the blue color there. And now the main event loop is blocked until the nested one finishes. It's finished basically. But the important thing to I understand from this is that the nested event loop uses the same dispatcher as the main event loop. So all the events are still, still processed, and even the parent can be deleted. So use it with the, some care. Typically, it is safe to use for those moral dialogues. So basically, you can think those nested event loops like uh, nested while loops. So when you start the inner while, inner while loop, the code after that while statement in the outer while, outer while loop needs to wait for the inner while loop to finish. And that's what happen, happens with the nested event loops. Okay, in the previous slide we saw that how the event dispatcher and event loop makes sure that events, events are passed to the event handlers. But what are those event handlers in the queue? And how you can hook your own application to that, to that event routing? <coughs> so basically the first possibility to handle the events in queue is to override the queue application notify. Uh, that method receives uh, all uh, spontaneous events from the, from the uh, event dispatcher. Asynchronous application generated events from the post event queue and also the synchronous application generated events from when you are calling the queue application send event. So basically all events are passed through this, this notify method. That is for example good place to get some unhandled exceptions in your code. Then the second chance to handle the events in, in Qt is the application level event filter. You can have a, a 
several filters per application. And for example, if you want to catch the catch the events for disabled, uh, disabled uh, widgets, this can be the good place to do that. And then the third place to catch those events is are the object level event filters. And those only receive the events that are targeted to the, that object. So they are very similar to application level event filters, but the only difference being that it only receives the events for that object. Then you can re-implement the G-object event method. And that gives you possibility to handle the events before the virtual event handlers are called. So for example, QWidget re-implements this QObject event method to handle the focus changes when you press the tab, tab key, basically. And then you have those event handlers, which are the most common, and, but at the same time, the least powerful way to handle the events. So you just um, implement virtual method like timer event, uh, key press event, mouse press event, or whatever. Okay, then one slide about event propagation. So probably the most important thing to remember from, from this is that only the events to the Q widgets are propagated. So events for other classes like QTCP socket or QTimer are not propagated. And as I mentioned earlier, the event, events are always targeted to uh, one object. And when speaking about the uh, widgets, this object is typically the topmost widget which has the focus. So the event propagation takes place in, in such situations where the, when the event is not handled by the topmost widget. And what then marks the events as handled? That there are actually two different ways to do that. You can call the Q event ac accept, or you can return the true from the event handling routine. So that is how the event propagation works. And I actually have one small example here of the propagation where I, I assume that no one actually handles that event and that the Q, Q, Q pass button is clicked but no one is handling it. So first the Q pass button gets that event. If that doesn't handle it, it goes to the Q widget and if that doesn't handle it, it goes to the Q main window. Okay, then the summary of the event processing. So there are two different event types or high-level event types in the queue. You can have a spontaneous and non-spontaneous events. And all the events are represented by the queue event classes. And the application can send or post events. So the send sending is synchronous and posting is asynchronous operation. And events can be inter accepted and handed in the multiple levels in the application, as we saw in the, some previous slides. And events from the different sources are dispatched by the Q event dispatcher, and there is one instance of that per thread. And for utility threads, you need to create one by yourself if you want, want, to, want to handle event, but that's, that's, that's not necessary or must have there. And then the event loop is, is the entity that controls how the event dispatcher works. And the event loop is modal, so it blocks until, until the execution is finished. Okay, any questions about the event processing? No. 
I guess that they should. <laughs> Okay, that would be interesting to study actually that how it that how that works in that way. Sounds a bit, yeah. Um, you said that um, events are only propagated in two bits. Yes. What about uh, two graphic scene events in two graphic items and their parent? Well, then I'm not, not too complex, but to do that. Yeah. I'm not actually now very sure, but I think they are propagated. I'm not, it should be checked. I, I can't answer to that, really. I don't know. Yeah. Okay, then there's just one slide about the, as a summary of the all, all of the things. So which, uh, which were the most important concepts of the Qt? Private implementation, that's, that's needed for the binary compatibility reasons. And implicit sharing, that's used for the memory optimization. And meta up system, which provides the reflection capabilities for C++ and the signal slots functions of functionality. And then the event processing, which is needed to the efficient power and resource usage. So that's it, and you can give feedback with that application or with some other forms from this presentation. Thanks for joining. <laughs>